Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are in the world. And uh, as Julie pointed out, happy International Year of the Soils. The UN uh, highlighted uh, this topic for two reasons. One is, of course, the importance of soil in our lives, but also the fragile nature of soils around the world and the challenges that farmers face in producing enough food for all of us. So it's appropriate that we bring in two of the uh, great experts on the topic who have many years of experience working with smallholder farmers uh, around the world. Now, land degradation or soil degradation is an incredibly big challenge, particularly now as we're expanding our global human population. A recent International Food Policy Research Institute book shows that global land degradation is now costing hundreds of billions of dollars. That includes lost productivity, less efficient use of the inputs that farmers purchase to grow their crops. And so right at the time that populations in these especially vulnerable regions such as Sub-Saharan Africa are needing to increase productivity to feed a growing population, they also, these farmers also, have to raise their yields significantly, their crop yields. And of course, they're doing this on some of the most depleted, nutrient depleted, um, some of the thinnest soils that farmers have worked with in, in human history. Now, on the bright side, the investments made to improving soil health, restoring soil fertility, the returns on those investments are quite large. Uh, recent studies have, have found that $1 investment in soil rehabilitation returns $5 in returns to greater productivity, more efficient use of inputs, and so on. So there are many bright spots out there uh, in terms of reversing some of the damage done, improving the soil conditions, and of course improving the livelihoods of the farmers that feed the feed the rest of us. Um, to highlight some of the bright spots and, and also some of the challenges that are faced around the world, we have uh, two great scientists, soil scientists, that have worked for decades in some of these more vulnerable regions of the world. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Jeff Heinrich. Uh, he's a senior technical advisor for Catholic Relief Services. Uh, he's worked for over 25 years directly with farmers in both Africa and Asia, so has a, a, a great understanding, a deep understanding of the issues faced by farmers, what, uh, what drives their decision making within their households, and how soil degradation directly affects them. Uh, Jeff has a PhD in crop and soil science, and he's worked with a range of institutions um, on this issue. Then, after Jeff speaks on the topic, uh, we'll have Dr. Seglinda Snap from Michigan State University speaking on her specific work in, in Africa. Uh, SIG has won many awards. Most recently, the American Society of Agronomy recognized her as a fellow for her contributions both in the United States and internationally. Uh, she's had many, many journal articles, extension bulletins. She specializes really in participatory action research and has really pioneered some of the research designs and how best to work with farmers, including uh, the mother and baby trial design for which she's possibly best known. Uh, I should say she's a soils and cropping systems ecologist at Michigan State University and the associate director of the Center for Global Change in Earth Observations. Um, SIG really works uh, with many, many different partners, so she has uh, first-hand first um, direct interactions with farmers, but also many of the development agencies and research institutions that do this work. Um, so with that, I'd like to uh, turn it over to Jeff, who is uh, speaking to us from Malawi this afternoon.
Uh, thanks very much, Jerry. Uh, that was a really nice introduction on the soils issues. Uh, thank you for that. And uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone, as Jerry noted, depending on where you are in the world. I'm going to talk today about uh, restoring soil health for smallholder resilience in Africa and looking at critical issues and options. And um, Jerry has started this conversation well, but I'd also like to add my own with some quotes and photos just to outline the magnitude of that problem. So the first one uh, is this quote from the Dust Bowl days in the U.S. that uh, humankind, despite its artistic present, uh, pretensions, its sophistication and many accomplishments, owes its existence to a six-inch layer of topsoil and the fact that it rains. And that might be a slight oversimplification, but essentially it's true. We really depend so much on the soil. Uh, this picture is from central Malawi, and this land has been prepared for planting. It doesn't take a lot of imagination to predict what's going to happen when you get the first heavy rain. And in fact, the end result can be sort of seen up near the crest of the hill where it's basically turning to stone. Here's another quote in the photo. The rainfall runoff takes about 40% of the nutrients applied to the soil in Africa through organic and mineral resources. This is part of the, the losses that Jerry referred to. Uh, and you can imagine from this picture how it might be true. So this picture was taken by a person named Peter Uggard, but it's, this phenomenon is common in traditional systems. And you can see the massive loss of of water, of soil, of seeds, and any fertilizer and manure that's been applied in the field. And so, I mean, the question is, how long can this be sustained without major impacts on yield and food security? It's obviously having important impacts even from this current season. So, um, here's a quote from FAO. In, in Africa, the most conspicuous symptoms of the negative impacts on land degradation uh, on food production are stagnating and declining yields and increasing levels of poverty. So actually, this picture is cheating slightly because it's from Bolivia, <laughs> but it uh, illustrates the point uh, that the impacts of land degradation are devastating. And if you notice down at the bottom of the hill along that pathway, there are two homesteads, and one can imagine that life for them is difficult and somewhat precarious. Uh, if you would notice also the big gullies on the hillside, we're going to uh, come back and talk a little bit about those later. But I guess the point here is that it's very difficult to increase household food security and incomes in rural areas unless we really take care of the soil resource. OK, um, one final slide with, with quotes and st some statistics. That in, in Africa, so land degradation has already gone very far. And, and in terms of area that's already damaged, 65% of area of arable land is already severely damaged. And actually, some figures are closer. Sure. So um, in terms of land that's already damaged, it's over 2 thirds of the arable land, 30% of grazing land, and 20% of forests. Uh, another observation is that Africa is already a food short, and it imports $40 billion worth of food annually. Uh, soil is the cornerstone of food security, and its conservation should become a major global priority. And there certainly is a, a crisis of land degradation and soil management. So these, these final quotes are actually from a Montpellier panel in 2014 that was composed of some pretty eminent persons. But the takeaway, really, from these pictures and from these quotes is, is, OK, so food is already in short supply in Africa if it's importing $40 billion annually. Yields are stagnant or declining. The population is doubling every 20 years. And the potential for a major food crisis is very high, uh, going well beyond the food price crisis that we saw in 2008, which, if I remember correctly, there were riots in over 10 capital cities across the continent. So the key to avoiding disaster in the medium term really is restoring the soil and increasing the productivity and incomes of rural households and communities. Um, 
And actually restoring the soil and regenerating its productive capacity has to be done before other technologies like improved seed and fertilizer can really be effective. And there's some evidence that shows that fertilizer efficiency in Africa is very directly related to the soil organic matter, which is very low and generally declining. So that's a bunch of bad news. Uh, so we'll switch over to some good news. <laughs> Uh, the good news is that we can reverse soil degradation processes and restore productivity with known technology. We don't need any new information, and we can do it quite quickly uh, in a relatively short time span if we just focus our resources and energy on that. Uh, to do it, we need to work at both the landscape level and the farm level, uh, and I'm going to talk about those separately. Um, we'll start with the landscape level. And, and management at the landscape level is really vital because a number of important ecosystem services can only really be managed effectively uh, at that level. And water is probably the best example. So the photo here is from a Food for Peace project in southern Malawi. Uh, and if you remember those big gullies that were on the, we saw on the hillside, so there were some of these gullies here. And as part of the overall watershed restoration process, uh, check dams were built in those gullies. And you can see those people are standing on one of the check dams. But within two years, the soil filled in behind those check dams, and people were able to cultivate there again. At the end of the project, we went back. There were 32 uh, different watersheds that were rehabilitated. At the end of the project, we went back and, and talked to communities in a number of those watersheds. And they reported very consistently uh, increases in stream flows, sometimes quite dramatic, uh, rising water tables in their wells. Uh, and people also reported that they, with the watershed management, they started getting better yields even in dry years uh, than they used to get when there were good rains. And if you can imagine all of the water that was pouring off the hillside in that second slide, uh, you can understand why. If you capture that and it goes into the soil, that really gives you much higher potential. So the watershed management work really stabilized the soil, but it also did great things for the water resource. So looking at some of the options for uh, landscape level management, th there are a lot of them. Uh, I've just put a couple here. Uh, I put there community-based natural resource management right at the top because actually Communities need to be engaged uh, if we're going to have effective landscape level man management. The, the communities are the custodians of their areas, and without their support, uh, effective interventions are not really possible. So but once the communities are engaged, then there are a lot of things that can be done. Uh, CRS has done a lot of good work, I think very effective work, on watershed management, mostly through Food for Peace projects, actually, which is one of the few kinds of projects in which this work can be effectively done. But we've also done quite a bit in, in Latin America with uh, support from the Howard Buffett Foundation. The farmer managed natural regeneration is also really another very good intervention. I saw Doug Brown was on the line. World Vision had a lot to do with the development of that. Um, but it's been used effectively in West Africa. Um, to regreen over 5 million hectares and really stop desertification. It's a really low cost effective technology. It doesn't maybe have an immediate massive effect on crop yields, but it certainly is very good at protecting the landscape. And then the issues of don't burn and don't deforest are basic tenants, but they're so common and so devastating uh, across Africa that I think they really need to be emphasized. OK, uh, there's lots of things that can be done. I've only touched on a few for the landscape level stuff, but in the interest of time, I'm going to move to uh, farm level uh, approaches for soil regeneration. But before we look at specific technical approaches, there are two things I think we really need to consider very carefully. First is that farmers have very serious constraints uh, in terms of adopting new technology. and we. If we want technologies to be adopted quickly and at scale, we really have to take these things into consideration. And there are a lot of technologies that have failed 
not because they were bad technologies, but because they didn't meet some of these criteria. The four key ones are the technology needs to not cost any extra money or labor, at least very little. The second thing is it has not to have big opportunity costs. And there I just note, for example, if you want farmers to start doing rotations, it means they have to not plant maize on part of their field uh, in any given year. And for example, eastern Zambia, 65% of farmers are net maize buyers. They don't produce enough already to feed their household, so convincing them not to plant on some of their land is quite difficult. Uh, anyway, so the issue of opportunity cost is there. There has to be immediate benefits. It doesn't help to say, OK, do this. And then five years from now, uh, everything will be fine, because farmers have also to live in the short term. So it really needs to have both short and long-term benefits. And last but not least, it needs to be feasible and accessible, which means really easy to apply. They need not to have to go to the capital city to get some sort of interest. It needs to be available and easy to apply in their local area. Okay, So the farmers have those technology adoption constraints. And then the second thing is that at the, at the macro level, the right policies and incentives need to be in place to promote regenerative forms of agriculture. And in that regard, so a lot of governments are still promoting sort of sole maize and commercial fertilizer, which are not bad in and of themselves, but they don't solve the soil problem. Uh, some governments are also promoting conservation agriculture, which again is a good thing. But it has three main components, which are um, minimum soil disturbance, maximum soil cover, and rotations. So quite often they can't do the rotations, and because of other things, they don't get as much mulch on the soil as they need, and so the impacts are relatively low, and we are seeing fairly slow adoptions. Like conservation agriculture by itself is good, but it's not really enough. So that's what I'm trying to say here. So we need practical, technical options that farmers can easily and profitably adopt. And we need to have the right policies and incentives in place. OK, so then what can we do? <laughs> so really, at the farm level, rebuilding the soil organic matter is, is the key issue. Uh, we need to rebuild the organic matter for a number of reasons. First is it increases the water holding capacity of the soil. So if you imagine a cement slab and you pour water on the cement slab, what happens? It all just runs away, right? So, but if you imagine now laying a big thick sponge layer over the cement and then pouring water on it, what happens? The water stays there, right? So that's what organic matter does for the soil, essentially. And the other thing it does is increase the nutrients in the soil as well as increase the nutrient availability to plants. And because of that, then it can really be effective in increasing the fertilizer use efficiency. So overall, the soil organic matter is really crucial to improving soil health and improving the fundamental productivity of the soil. Right, and the, the best thing that I have seen so far, the best option really, is um, green manure cover crops. Um, so green manure cover crops are different from traditional rotations or from what we think of as traditional green manure processes. Uh, and I won't go into detail. What you really should do is get Roland Bunch on here for an hour and just talk about that. I can really explain it very well. Um, but and I'll I will say a few things about it in a minute. But I'll just note that it's a really good option. It's often accompanied by minimum tillage. CRS is working with Roland Bunch on these options. Uh, have been for the last couple of years. Sorry, I think I've got ahead of myself. Right, I did. OK, so I do want to say something about this picture, though. So this is not Roland Bunch in this picture, but it is a green manure cover crop system. So this uh, picture was taken this past year in Zambia. This is a maize and velvet bean intercrop. It has had no commercial fertilizer for the last six years. Uh, it has had some uh, cattle manure, but that's all. So, and they were expecting a six-ton maize yield in this year, which is pretty good. Uh, as I mentioned, the green manure cover crops are different from traditional rotations in green manures. Mainly, 
what they are are cereal and legume intercropping systems or cereal tree crop intercropping systems that improve soil fertility and reduce weeds. And the legume also often has a, a food or income benefit. And I think they're the best option because they usually don't require any extra costs or labor or external inputs and they often produce additional food income uh, from the legume crop as a benefit. The last point to consider is when you use them to increase soil organic matter, they can sequester uh, large amounts of carbon. Okay, so this picture also shows the potential of a green manure cover crop system. These pictures are from this past rainy season in the Luangwa Valley in Zambia. Uh, and they're from a project that was being run by an organization called Comaco. So the picture on the left is what most of the maize fields in the area look like. And this is sole maize with, with or without small amounts of commercial fertilizer. They were undergoing quite severe moisture stress and the yield expectations were also quite low. The picture on the right, uh, which is actually only a couple hundred meters from the other picture, uh, shows a field of a smallholder farmer that's been using uh, maize intercrop with glyrosidia for the last six years. And again, they don't use commercial fertilizer. They were just using uh, some small amount of cattle manure. You can see one of the stumps of the glyrosidia trees in the foreground. So in this system, the glyrosidia branches are cut, uh, pruned from the tree stalk uh, before planting and they're laid on the ground as a mulch and that increases rainfall infiltration, it prevents evaporation uh, and soil erosion, it reduces weed growth and it adds, adds a lot of organic matter and nitrogen to the soil. So there were quite a number of plots where farmers were using the Glero City in that area and, and they were basically unaffected by below normal rainfall season. And I mean, the difference is quite stark, and I think it has important implications for food security and resilience. Okay. Um, this is a big issue. I just want to touch on it briefly. <laughs> so increasing soil organic matter and nitrogen availability usually requires intercropping with legumes or tree species or legume rotations. So to date, the commercial seed sector has shown very little interest in food legumes or tree species. So it can be a really big problem to get seeds. And I mean, CRS faces this every year in Southern Africa because like this year we have major seed relief programs in um, Malawi and in Madagascar. We've had them recently in Zimbabwe and Zambia. Uh, it's very difficult to find commercial supplies of food legumes, uh, even sometimes groundnuts. And we also, for our green manure cover crops, we are promoting in all of those countries. We want to do on-farm demonstrations. We sometimes struggle to get even enough seed to do the demonstrations, which is, is pretty bad. So um, we're going to need new systems for seeds if we want to go to scale. Uh, Right, so some of the systems that we might consider include working with the smaller seed companies on niche markets, working with farmer-based systems, or even working with the informal sector, like with this um, woman in this market in southern Malawi, in this picture here, who is clearly very well organized. Anyway, the seed issue is a big issue. I don't want to... Um, well, you can't really explain it in one slide, but I wanted to flag it and just to note that my colleague, uh, Louise Sperling, is working with, she's one of the world's leading experts on that. She's working with a number of people to start some initiatives to really try and address that. But it's going to be a critical issue uh, as we try to go to scale in rehabilitating and rebuilding soil organic matter. Okay, so to, just to wrap up, I would note that it is really crucial to invest in restoring the soil, both at the farm level and at the landscape level. At the farm level in particular, the soil organic matter is crucial, but if we can improve soil health, we will improve everything else. This needs to be a priority for governments, for donors, and for the private sector as well as farmers. 
And to, to encourage adoption at scale, we need the right policies and incentives, and we are going to have to address the seed issue. I have not said much about the private sector in this presentation, uh, but I would just note that they have a really important role to play, both in increasing the soil productivity and in the seed issue. If we have time at the end, we can maybe discuss that a bit more. But the good news from all of this is that there is a lot that can be done that the impacts can be achieved quite rapidly. But as we do that, we need to remember that new technologies must address and fit within farmers' real needs and constraints. Uh, and in that regard, I like to remember the phrase or the, the saying that it's only bad technology that requires really good extension systems. So anyway, so thank you very much. I'll leave it there for now. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'll turn it over about what work that comes out of that work from the early 90s and is built on many connections, which I will get back to. But I just want to acknowledge uh, right up front that my uh, co-authors here, um, supported by uh, IITA Africa Rising, which is a project of USAID. And uh, we couldn't do it without this interdisciplinary team of ag economists, soil scientists, uh, budding the next generation of agronomists and um, and our support from IITA. So I uh, hope you all have seen the challenges up here. So we've been hearing a bit about how degraded soil seem to be a driver of food insecurity and environment insecurity. And in fact, they go both directions. Um, food poverty has been seen recently to be correlated in some areas with degraded soil. So I think we're all here to try and figure out how to break those links and support increases in soil rehabilitation to support food security, ultimately. Now, we hear a lot about degraded soils from conversion of marginal lands that shouldn't be in agriculture. But I want to talk more about the other problem, which is continuous production without enough investment. So this is a way that soils are degraded, as shown here in Zimbabwe. and Imagine you're in your shoes of these farmers and extension officers trying to see how we can turn this around. But one of the underlying factors, I think, is this short, uh, very only four months of the year that a crop is growing. So maize is growing for maybe four months. And then we have this long dry season. Again, this is from Malawi showing uh, lands ready for planting. But if you can imagine how vulnerable this soil is to water and wind erosion. Now, we have seen recent evidence from my student, Professor in Pecatula, who just became a PhD yesterday. He'll be going back to teach University of Malawi. And very exciting but disturbing news. When the Food and Agriculture Organization went around different parts of Malawi and dug pits and most of the soil much that we use today come from that effort in the late 80s, early 90s around Africa to document soil. So we went back to these locations. So over this 25 years, we found that in areas where there's continuous production in, in the redder areas, this is where there's also we are seeing reduction in soil carbon. Not just where forests have been converted uh, to um, agriculture, which certainly there's a loss in organic matter then, but just continuous production is leading to small but significant decline. So we seem to be not at a new plateau, but at a continuous decline in soil carbon, at least in Malawi, and that is quite worrying. So many of us here in this virtual room, we're all in this project together, and we've heard about some of the options, community level, but when we talk just about farmer decision making at household plot level, in terms of legumes to address both nitrogen and organic matter at once, and also human health, because legumes provide protein-rich beans, farmers, offer, we give them options. Like in the mid-90s, working with um, Bunda College of Agriculture and with Rockefeller Support and Chitezi Ministry of Agriculture, we were able to try out a whole bunch of annual legumes. And we continue to work on improved varieties of beans, peanuts, also called groundnuts, soybeans, cowpea, 
But in order to really improve soil fertility, these don't do that because the nutrients all go into we eat them or we sell them, right? Perennials, such as agroforestry, you heard about. This is Trifosia, which is fairly easy to establish for an agroforestry system just from seed. You can see it's green leaves between the maize, supporting very productive maize. But and certainly this works. And I'm big promoter of green manures, as we heard about, and agroforestry. However, decades of work later, action research around these desperate options for legumes, we found, in fact, rarely could the poorest farmers adopt these. Probably these opportunity costs, uh, even though we try and develop technologies that, and build on farmers' technologies that are you know, really low cost. But still, we just don't see a lot of traction. And so more and more, we've focused on a middle way, a type of legume, a shrub, like pigeon pea, um, which is eaten, but is also um, produces, particularly when it's raccooned and grown for two years, which is massive amounts of fuel wood, as you'll see, and also um, soil fertility regeneration. Climbing bean is another one of these, kind of in the sweet spot in between, something that grows for at least a year. Lacuna in, or velvet bean, also called velvet bean, is eaten in some places, but most places is just used as a forage. So we really see shrubby pigeon pea and climbing bean in colder areas where that can be grown as kind of this unique middle way of long duration legume, these pulse systems. So if you want to see uh, how this works, we tried to test for different soil types, different climate conditions, which requires models. Here's the Apsin model, which is one of the few crop models that are calibrated for southern eastern Africa and that allow you to look at intercrops. And you'll see on the top uh, right here that the, the three systems that have pigeon pea in them are the, the only ones where you see an increase in soil nitrogen over time. So that's modeling data, and it's encouraging. But what do we see in the field? Well, we see farmers adopting varieties, such as Macron Jamni, a uh, type of pigeon pea, that have the, these multiple benefits. Pigeon pea that gives you grain, that also bring fuel, fuel wood. This is from Malawi, where farmers, this, this new variety is spreading like wildfire. I can say that. And it is providing increased food security, as well as environmental security, and that they can grow their own fuel wood. So it's quite encouraging. But we wanted to see if it could fit into new places in Malawi, beyond southern Malawi, where there's markets currently. And also, what are the impacts on soil fertility? Could it be a three-way? Well, pigeon pea, another way it recommends itself to farmers is that it can be grown as an intercrop. And particularly the, the traditional varieties and some of the farmer selected varieties, like Mahuan Jumi, that I just mentioned, are good intercrops. In fact, that's how they're grown. They, you can plant them right at the same time as maize. They're very small initially, but so they don't interfere with the maize crop. And so you can get two crops for the same amount of labor. And in fact, they can suppress weeds, which is another encouraging fact and aspect of them. However, one of the challenges is this doesn't rest the soil from continuous maize production. Maize, we have found, doesn't actually increase soil fertility, even soil organic matter, despite all the residues, unless you can somehow break all that maize. And it's very difficult for, you can imagine, if you only have an acre of land, how can you dedicate part of it to uh, soil rehabilitation that doesn't give you food? So this is a system that is the sweet spot that uh, I think is really encouraging because it gives us two legumes, so two crops. Here's groundnut is shown. That also you can grow soybean or common bean. Cowpea is a bit more challenging. It's very competitive. You can grow these as an understory in pigeon pea. You can see pigeon pea um, here is, you can see how thick the stems get even in just one year. And we can cut them off and raccoon them and then get a second year of growth. And then in the third year, we have like a, a pure maize crop in some cases, or sometimes maize bean. So farmers are experimenting in different options with this. But we, through support from Africa Rising, are looking at different ways that their pigeon tea can be deployed, because you wouldn't want to disseminate it in areas where it took up too much water for all these benefits. We have to look carefully at risks. 
uh, particularly in the changing climate and with the variable climate that we know is uh, Southern Africa faces and much of Africa. So we found that although pigeon peas grown here in the south, in Blantyre, there's markets, in fact, an optimal area is in the middle. And so we need to see um, where it can be tried out and new varieties can provide these new options for farmers that provide immediate returns as well as the long-term soil rehabilitation. Up here near Mizuzu in the north, uh, actually is an area where now over 100 villages and tens of thousands of farmers have adopted this doubled up legume with pigeon pea. And there's actually been changes in child health, which is very exciting and needs to be more carefully studied because it's, it shows how this can have transformative effects when you uh, address these underlying issues. So let's talk about central Malawi, where Africa Rising now has been working since 2012. And we have chosen four different sites that represent different agroecologies, from the hot, dry Galamokti near the lakeshore to the most uh, high potential mesic area, closer to markets in Longway and Tipi. So we have 1,400 farmers now engaged in mother baby child. Um, and in fact, farmers are experimenting with these different options. Um, we provide a lot of technical support and seeds initially for access to the latest varieties and integrated approaches, including um, integration to livestock value chains, dairy. But other farmers, you know, it depends on the different types of um, households and their socioeconomic, um, what the aspects of these legume options they might adopt. But we are trying to explore them, both through this on-farm experimentation through mother baby trials but also through modeling to see where things might um, be best disseminated. So this is intensive action research with these thousand some farmers and many partners, including uh, Bunda College, Luana, and um, also IETA and SIAT. But and, and Extension is very integral to this work. Malawi Extension couldn't do that without them. But what we're learning, we're not just trying to do direct development. We're trying to do research to understand where and how these technologies might uh, have the best um, impact. So this is just shows you a few pictures of this um, on-farm experimentation. The pigeon pea, here's pigeon pea and ground nuts again, double up like in, different pigeon pea varieties. And to point out that, again, we're not just deploying certain technologies. We are trying to support farmer experimentation. And this, you can see just after two years, farmers have started to expand areas. And we have female and male farmers here. Women in particular seem to be looking at the legume technology. Here's some of the double up legumes being tried out. And then legume legumes. And then many are trying the small amounts of manure, compost, different com integrated approaches, which uh, don't have time to go into. But it's very interesting to sort of learn from which technologies farmers continue to experiment with. And then we're trying to see what is the impact then on long term and soils, and then ultimately on income and even gender equity is being looked at. So, what you know, one of the big unknowns, in my view, is we promote these technologies to improve soils, but we don't know how they perform often, in particularly on um, in the stressed environment and when soils are degraded. Can we use a technology that really provides food every year to also improve soil fertility? So we're quantifying the biomass by these multi-purpose legumes. And I'm going to give some data, and, uh, particularly in terms of pigeon pea. And this is based on uh, Shwindu, Graham Beer's work. She's from Zimbabwe and is doing a PhD with us in Africa Rising, working with the uh, Malawi farmers closely and has gone to almost 100 fields where she's uh, dug pits to try and sieve out the roots so we can look at below ground what's going on. Something that actually I dreamed about doing in the 90s. So it's really great to be getting back to it and seeing the next generation take this on and try and test. Because we can't even calibrate models unless we really understand the interaction with farmer practices, which currently are still rigid in Malawi, although they're trying in some places some other options. And you know, these degraded soils we talked about and different weather conditions and different market conditions. These are very complex environments. But one aspect is to understand performance. So 
So let me talk about a trade-off here. There's one last issue here. Um, in terms of, I, I just want to point out that on one hand, a sole pigeon pea, which some farmers tried, even though we think of this as a very good intercrop because it grows slowly at first, I think farmers wanted to particularly, this is new to many farmers in this part of Malawi, although other areas it's widely grown and sold all the way into India, as many of you may know. Um, right, the major pull from I mean, anyone eats Indian food is, is eating pigeon pea, and it's, it's eaten to some degree uh, in Malawi as a green pie, for example. So, so pigeon pea is incredibly productive. There's roots about 10% of the biomass that you can see, you know, 12 tons on the farm, which is a phenomenal amount of biomass. And then when you combine it with groundnuts, the groundnut suppresses pigeon pea a little bit. And so, yeah, and particularly the current system where farmers uh, often grow pigeon pea in the south, they use maize pigeon pea. You get the least amount of pigeon pea biomass, although there's still significant amounts. Four tons is enough to, you know, really support soil rehabilitation. And what about grain? You know, pigeon pea grain, again, you get the most over two years uh, from a soil pigeon pea. But uh, you, you get substantial amounts when you grow it with a legume, and then the least amount with maize is quite competitive with pigeon pea. But you might think, why don't farmers adopt soil pigeon pea? Well, if you look at it over two years and look at a maize pigeon pea intercrop each year, you start to see the reverse relationship. And then, obviously, when maize is, is there, or when maize is grown in a rotation, then you get quite substantial amounts of maize grain and small amounts of pigeon pea. So it's a whole different scale when we start to talk about maize. Maize is very productive. That's why people grow it. And also, maize is life in Malawi, right? It's a you know, very important cereal around the world, in fact. But if, if we look at it in terms of protein, we would see that pigeon pea does a little bit better. But generally, you can see why the focus on more maize-based systems, even though it's not ideal for soil regeneration. So we're just trying to explore these, these trade-offs so that people understand them better. And I want to point out, this is one of the last things I really I hope a take home for you, is that currently a lot of the focus is on soil maize, or even a rotation of maize, such as maize groundnut. And in some work that was done some while ago, countrywide in Malawi, we found that by just adding fertilizer, you can improve um, your variability. In other words, make it uh, more stable crops, so less variability. This is a coefficient of variation here. And so typically on farm, we get about 20% variation. Um, but you can reduce that by adding fertilizer. You get a more vigorous crop. But the only way you can really reduce it and get a very stable, in other words, resilient crop, which is what this talk is partly about, is if we had a pigeon pea in the system. And in fact, we also, Mayor Makuna did this as well. But it's less popular with farmers because Makuna is eaten only in a few areas and more for traditional and ceremonial use and is has to be heavily processed. Uh, sometimes multiple year, hours uh, of fuel would require to leach out the poisons in it. So Makuna certainly is very effective also, but pigeon pea is something you can eat and sell you know, as much more easily. Um, in terms of fitting into the current farming system. So pigeon pea with maize, you can use half the fertilizer rate and really reduce stability. Although we weren't able to measure soil changes over the short time frame in this uh, tremendously large major effort uh, from maize uh, team back in the day at Chitedzi. However, you'll notice that um, the only, I mean, we weren't able to see differences in organic matter, which takes five to 10 years. But the fact that, that maize, when it's grown after a pigeon pea doubled up system or after macuna, in fact, it is more stable of a yield, that in itself tells you that probably um, that is a system that's improving the soil performance. So that's the indicator that we're using this. So we need to keep exploring different uh, legumes, such as uh, lab lab, climbing bean in colder areas, pigeon pea in different combinations, and getting new varieties of pigeon pea, such as this one that I showed you that had that tremendous amount of fuel wood. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the improved varieties of pigeon pea keep being shorter. They call them extra, extra short duration. There are some medium duration ones that have been released in, in Malawi. I was talking about more uh, throughout 
India and Africa. The focus, a lot of breeding efforts has been on super short types of pigeon bee. And yet what we need is these medium and long duration types, in my view, to provide some food, but also give us this real rehabilitation. And I want to take you through it from, again, from our, some of our crop simulation models. We can start to look at effects in different um, weather conditions for different soils. Um, we have some papers on the climate change impacts, but I uh, and resilience to that. But here I want to focus on soils. That's what our talk is today. So if you have a high fertility soil on the left, we compare it to a low fertility soil, a typical most of Malay. The high fertility soil, one of the things we have to keep in mind is that then maize, in a maize pigeon pea intercrop, we're just looking at maize because farmers usually do that initially, and we don't want to put farmers' maize at risk in, in any way. Um, so we have to make sure that this doesn't happen here on the bottom left, where an intercrop in the first two years has put maize yields at risk a little bit. We want to make sure that, that we are promoting systems, and, and this is probably because of the competition of, of a high maize crop in this high fertility condition. Every other year, slowly the soil is built, and so maize um, yields responded, right? And in this is the low fertility condition, more typical of most farmers. Maize by itself, with just about 20 kgs of nitrogen, just um, is very modest over time. And, and you have to do some rehabilitation um, in order to, to make a difference here in terms of um, through pigeon pea, you know, kind of improving. And you can see that the intercrop is exciting in that you always have a maize crop every year. The rotation is every other year, but benefits are more uh, substantial in terms of rehabilitating the soil. And we continue to explore this because we think that there's some circumstances where maybe there's too much water use, where again we have to look at mulching and ways to improve water infiltration. So there's trade-offs here we have to think about. Um, we're not deploying these everywhere, but we're just seeing that, in fact, um, some of these systems can cause minimum risk to the farmer but uh, really do some soil rehabilitation while providing a uh, double by game crop, something they can eat today. So we're working on a uh, schematic uh, with help from the Africa Rising Communication Team um, from IITA and trying to show how there might be different um, sustainable intensification pathways for different farmer groups. One of them, where farmers really need to rehabilitate part of their farm, suppose they have um, a hectare, so a third of it can go into this ground, not pigeon pea, and then that's moved around and you followed by maize um, bean intercrop to make sure you're, you're addressing uh, human nutrition needs and uh, improve value crops to sell. So the final slide. What I want to uh, focus here is um, that there may be different pathways for different groups. Uh, a very entrepreneurial farmer, this lady here, you know, they uh, linked into markets. She might be able to start to invest in um, latest soybean and pigeon pea varieties, inoculum for the soybean, um, advanced post-harvest processing, and a fairly straightforward, intensified, but sustainable production system. Uh, this is a pathway that uh, has occurred elsewhere. Soybean has been uh, pretty rapidly adopted in some places. But what about farmers that maybe a widow, a you know, little labor on farm, how can they rehabilitate the soil? Because they start in a de degraded site, uh, it's very hard to get out of that cycle of poverty, as we've talked about. And so we're saying to education, because we personally, I think that one of the reasons that green manures and, and some of these perennial pulse options have not taken off as fast as we like, because we're working on them, we have to acknowledge for 20 years or so, is because, in fact, um, they need some education. You need to have the access to the seed, but you also need to, to have some more information. Currently, there's no recommendations about rat tuning pigeon pea, for example. So we can start working on that with our extension colleagues and eventually help all farmers get into more sustainable intensification. Thanks very much. And in addition to all the co-authors from IATA and uh, MSU on this talk, I also want to acknowledge you know, the long-term relationships and support we've had from many donors and amazing farmers, as well as um, academic colleagues from around the world. Thanks very much.
I think I wanted to just end with this top takeaways, uh, both from Jeff and I, uh, that we want to increase food security. I think we all are in agreement here that there needs to be ways to regenerate productive tax capacity of soil. But these won't get adopted unless they fit very closely with farmer needs. And Jeff and I are completely in sync with this. I think that's the general uh, feeling now. But one of the ways, I feel, is through crop diversification of multipurpose pulses. Whether you're supporting a more organic or conservation agriculture approach or sustainable intensification, integrated nutrient management, whichever approach, we do all agree that we need more living soil cover. And one of the practical ways is the first step, whatever future steps you might want to do, like Fidobe Abada, which takes decades, but eventually would be just really um, called winter thorn. Some of these evergreen agriculture approaches are very important. But I think the first steps involve multi-purpose pulses, such as pigeon pea and common beans. But that's my experience. And uh, I look forward to the discussion. Great. Thank you so much, Jeff and Sig. We're thrilled that you were able to join us from your remote locations. Um, and we could hear you both well. And we greatly appreciated your presentations. As you can see, we've had a lot of chatting going on in the chat box. Um, thank you to all of our participants for, uh, for chatting and answering each other's questions and asking a lot of great questions. Uh, as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. And we will make sure that you have the PowerPoint, the recording, a uh, transcript of all these, all this chatter in the chat box. Um, everything you need will be sent to you via email um, in a, a week or so after this seminar. So keep an eye out for that. And we'll go ahead and spend about 30 minutes on Q&A with our presenters. So we had uh, a lot of questions come in for both of you. And I'm going to kind of synthesize some, uh, pick some uh, back and forth. But one question that came in uh, both during uh, Jeff's presentation and Sig's presentation was a desire to know a little bit more about the relationship between soil nutrients and nutrients in food and nutrients getting into human diets. Um, Claire, Baker, Claire Baker, Savannah Henderson um, both asked about how we can improve bioavailability of nutrients in soils by working through some of these uh, improve soil-based interventions. And so I was hoping that um, one or both of you could speak to that question. And so shall we start with Jeff, if you have any comments on that one? And just remember to unmute Hi. your microphone. There you go. I can yeah. hear you. <laughs> OK. Yeah, um, I'm not really an expert on that. Uh, and so I'm going to look more to see, see what she has to say. Um, I mean, I think there are, there are some important connections. So one of them often is uh, zinc. If uh, zinc is deficient in the soil, then it's often deficient in the food. And, and that has a lot to do with people's uh, sort of immune systems and resilience. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm hesitant to say more than that at this point. Let me hand it over to Sig. OK, well, if I get you right. And in fact, as I mentioned up north, um, we were with some with Rachel Besnicker and a hospital there in Equindini. And there has been improvements in diversity of diet uh, and also child under five height by weight gain. So that's a system to you know check out. But yes, sometimes legumes. And, and now they've moved on to, you know, looking at sorghum and sweet potato and yeah, just uh, even some Afghan yam. So a huge range of diversification. And I think that's, you know, well proven that one of the most important things is just to have a dietary uh, diversity can can really improve nutrient availability, as well as some of these new uh, more, you know, zinc and uh, iron fortified um, bean varieties, for example. So. I think diversification is, is really key here, uh, along with education, because you know, if people are sick, they still can't translate their improved diet into um, high health, health gain. So I think you know, check out Rachel Desna Kerr's, Andy Jones, and some other people's work that are nutritionists. But we are certainly trying to collaborate with such efforts, and we think it's very important.
Thank you to both of you. Excellent answer. Uh, we had uh, uh, Dick Tinsley, who's uh, an AgriLinks regular, ask a question wanting to delve a bit more into the labor requirements for farmers. Um, and, and the fact that household decision making and labor is, can be really a constraint. Um, in a lot of cases, it's not a matter of whether a soil building technology works or not, um, but whether the farmers um, can realistically, labor-wise, um, adopt that technology. And so, Sieg, we thought maybe you had done some studies and, and could address that question. Certainly, and I think Jeff should come in here, too. CRS is very aware of this. Um, so we keep examining the interactions with weeding, because weeding is one of the major labor constraints uh, in Malawi and subhuman tropics, and some of our drier areas work. Weeds are used a lot for fodder, and it's not just an issue. But uh, so in terms of, of labor, it is difficult to get good data and understand this. So one of the areas we look at is where you know, female headed households at all are labor constrained because they have one less adult in them, um, you know, which technologies they adopt and which ones they're doing, you know, trying out things. Um, I saw in the chat people were surprised at how women are innovating. Um, I'm not at all surprised by that. I, I, I find particularly when you have technologies that are appropriate, that, that women are very interested in, they, they will do a tremendous amount of innovation. And they're very concerned about too. We have to work in collaboration to see which systems will, you know, reduce uh, labor requirements. We may even have to look in certain areas where there's market linkages and where education is done with herbicides, which is a classic way around the world that we reduce labor. Uh, that may not fit with uh, everyone's uh, worldview, but I think we have to definitely straight on address this issue of labor. And in some ways, intercrops are very effective, which we can suppress a lot of weeds. Um, you know, we can look at some different strides of suppressing because um, it causes uh, a lot of uh, long-term problems. So we have to have an integrated approach. And uh, this has been a, a top priority of Africa Rising at different sites around the world. And I think we'll be synthesizing some of those lessons. And uh, uh, we'd really like to keep this discussion going because I think that's one of the reasons why some of the agroforestry systems um, haven't taken off as we'd like to see them as fast. Um, maybe this farmer regeneration approach will work. I'm looking forward to learning more about that because when we plant seeds and then uproot trees, as we've done with Trophosia, it's just too much labor. So apparently, you know, we, we haven't seen the adoption except for people that can afford, like chiefs, to hire labor. So I think that those questions are spot on and, and it's a work in progress but we have to pay attention to it. Absolutely true. Jeff, would you like to chime in? Uh, sure. Yeah, I'll just make a couple of quick comments. I, mean, I think Sig put it nicely. But in terms of uh, labor, a lot of the, some of the major requirements are for land preparation and for weeding. Also, women's labor for sourcing firewood. Um, with the green manure cover crops, you often get uh, a weed reduction benefit. Uh, and the second thing that I've seen in working with is if you really can improve the organic matter in the soil and improve the soil tilth, that you can often eliminate the need for the land preparation. As long as you've got a mulch on the soil, you don't have to till all that soil, which is actually the way they do it here in Malawi. It's a massive amount of labor. But you can just plant directly without uh, tilling the soil, and that's a huge savings. Uh, and then, like systems that Sig was talking about, some of the benefits of, of generating fuel would also uh, would be labor savings. Uh, yeah, I'll leave it there for now. Thanks. But I think it's, it's a really important question, and it has to be considered every time. Wonderful. Thank you both. We had a couple of questions come in that we think Jerry would be best positioned to answer. Uh, one was specifically for Jerry from Howard Davis. Um, very back at the beginning, Jerry had mentioned some research on uh, a $1 soil investment in a $5 return. So um, we'll let Jerry speak to where that research came from. And then also, Elon Gilbert asked, are USAID and other donor projects official, or effectively addressing soil and natural resources management issues in Malawi in Feed the Future projects in Malawi? 
Well, to address the first one on the five to one return on investment, the International Food Policy Research Institute publication, the global sorry, the global cost of land degradation, which is I believe listed as a 2016 publication, but it is available for downloading on their website. So if you just Google global cost of land degradation IFPRI, uh, it should come right up. I haven't looked into the details of how they arrived at that figure. In terms of effectively addressing soil and natural resource management issues, specifically in Malawi through Feed the Future projects, um, well, I guess the key term there is effectively, I mean, I'm very proud of the work that uh, our research is leading to. Um, uh, SIG is one of the partners on, on that work. Um, we're seeing some great progress um, on, in terms of developing solutions that are both, that, that produce impacts and results in terms of soil improvement, but also in terms of uh, household livelihoods. So, I mean, it's not a clear-cut, I can't provide a clear-cut answer. It, one, one, one can always do more. We should always be doing more, looking for uh, bigger and better impacts. But we certainly are addressing them in the projects through the Feed the Future initiative. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, Jeff, we had a question that came in during your presentation that I thought I would ask. From Glenn Burnett, um, he asked, since some of these processes take longer, maybe five years, uh, what do you do to create immediate benefits and still create long-term change? So what is that interplay between short-term benefits, if any, um, to produce long-term change in soils? And how do you market those short-term benefits versus the long-term benefits to farmers? Right, so that's a very good question, and uh, it's, it's often an issue when we're trying to promote improved soil management technologies. Uh, but I think, you know, the system that SIG is talking about, if you intercrop uh, with pigeon pea, hopefully you don't get as bad a reduction as some of our yields showed, but you shouldn't get a major reduction in the first year. You might get maybe 80%, but after that, your maize yield should go up. And actually, some, there's some good complementary uh, analysis or, or experiments with maize pigeon pea systems in Mozambique. Um, but you, you get an immediate cash benefit. Uh, also, so if you intercrop with some of the other legumes, you you get a food benefit. For example, if you intercrop, intercrop with uh, Lab Lab, you can get green leaf uh, benefit for food. You can eat the, the green pods, and uh, you know, processing the dry bean takes a bit longer, but you also get food for that. So the, the key thing is to have some immediate benefits like that in terms of food or income, uh, and then while the, the soil it might take two, three years to really start seeing an improvement. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, Sig, we had a question that came in during your presentation. Um, a couple of questions, actually, about phosphorus. Mike McGahey asked, for double up lagoon systems, are there challenges of providing sufficient amounts of phosphorus to get optimal results? Um, and Annalise Stratton also asked, what about phosphorus? Is there significant impact on phosphorus bioavailability in phosphorus limited soils? Would Canavalia be an appropriate addition to the system? So, so I'm really pleased you asked that because I didn't get to touch on phosphorus, which is one of my favorite topics. So, in fact, pigeon pea and groundnut are well known in the scientific literature to be able to access sparingly soluble pools. Now, what does that mean? What it means is that, unlike nitrogen, which is highly available when you add it as fertilizer and about 50% efficient, the crop uses 50% of it, in terms of phosphorus, about 80% often gets locked up in soils. That's being generous, often 90%. So we're only talking about 10, you know, very, very small amounts of efficiency. 
So that past investment, whether manure or fertilizer in phosphorus, we need to access that. And pigeon pea happens to produce a lot of organic acids, physic, um, there's some papers in science on this. Groundnut, too, there's a whole body of literature that in certain soil types, they can access that phosphorus and recycle it. So, you know, we're not a zero-sum game. We can actually use certain species, which are well known, to be able to access some of this phosphorus. Compost is also, it has organic acids and can often access past phosphorus. That said, we need to make investments every now and then in phosphorus. But whether that's on a, you know, once in 10 years we invest a massive amount of manure or fertilizer or once, once every year, I think the most important thing is then that we cycle it. And so we know we have certain species that can cycle it. Um, I'm sure there's some green manures. I'm less familiar with that literature. But pigeon pea, when we've measured the phosphorus in the leaves, has very high levels. So it needs it, but it also has ways to access it. And so this should not be overlooked as a way to biologically ameliorate and make the soil more productive through whatever investments are made by farmers. With whatever fertilizer or compost they can afford, let's make sure that it's used in a very good way. And that does require more than a something like maize that can grow for four months. We need something that can grow for 10 months, two years, like pigeon pea, that can keep accessing that phosphorus and making it available for other crops like maize. You know, compost and other things, I'm seeing people keep bringing this up. Yes, we're about integrated nutrient management. But compost takes a lot of labor, and fertilizers are very expensive. So let's get the biggest bang for our buck. Whatever compost and fertilizers farmer can afford, let's make sure those are used well. And so we need nitrogen fixation, and we need you know, accessing all the phosphorus, mining it, if you will, so that it's used rather than it's just locked up forever in the soil. So to do that, there's only certain species, and they mostly happen to be legumes, that allow you to do that. And to do them in a significant way, you have to have a perennial or semi-perennial shrub or, or vine or even a tree to do that, because it just takes time to access it. So without those in the landscape, then we're just really throwing away a lot of fertilizer. So I think the combination of compost, fertilizer, and the right suite of legume options is important for our maze-based systems to perform in a sustainable way. Thanks. Thanks so much, Sig. Uh, we had a question that I think builds a little bit on what you were just saying about fertilizer being expensive and, um, and in some cases being wasted. And maybe we can pivot to Jeff to start answering on this question. Um, a question about the relationship between fertilizer subsidies and all of the practices that you've been talking about today that build soil. Is fertilizer helping boost yields at the cost of soil health? Are subsidies of fertilizer potentially inhibiting some of these soil building practices that, that you're referencing? So do you have any comments on fertilizer subsidies and, and whether those should be promoted as part of a package? Yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> The governments love to subsidize fertilizer, and actually, I mean, to some extent, you could say it's a good thing because you know, maintaining fertility levels in the soil is uh, a, a, an important public good. Um, and I think when the World Bank removed, or, or I think, the, what was it, back in the late 80s, early 90s, a lot of the fertilizer subsidies were removed and, and uh, crop yields in this part of the world crashed. Uh, so, fertilizer in itself is, I don't think, is not a bad thing. The problem is that I think there's just too much of a focus on seed and improved varieties of, of maize, and we aren't making those investments in improving soil health overall. So, and some of the figures are quite stark. So, as I say, 40% of the fertilizer that's applied is lost just in the rain, uh, you know, in runoff. Uh, and probably other ways, or um, you know, the, the effectiveness of the fertilizer that's given out is much lower if the organic matter levels in the soil are low. So we're losing a lot of the potential benefit of those fertilizers, both from from erosion and from you know the lack of soil health. So there is a really valid argument to say actually. 
whether you maintain the subsidies or not, we still need to do other investments to make those subsidies really pay off. And actually, so uh, ICRA and, and uh, agroforestry, the Evergreen Agriculture Partnership, are, are making some inroads with uh, COMESA to look at replacing some of the fertilizer subsidies with uh, fertilizer trees. It's either Phyderbia or Glutacidia. Um, I think that's a good start. I think there are lots of other things that need to go along with it. Uh, but yeah, I think there's much that needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you so much for your, your deft answers to these questions. Uh, we have about 10 more minutes, and so um, we'll ask you a, a few more along the way. We had a, an interesting question come in from James Brett Harrison, who wanted to know a bit more about the future of research. What further research regarding green manure and cover crops and or nitrogen fixing legumes would you, the presenters, like to see done in sub-Saharan Africa or more generally? Some of us here on the webinar are in positions to carry out that research or are actively designing said research and would appreciate your advice. Maybe I can come in. So I just wanted to point out that, that we found when we were working on Makuna and other green manures um, and agroforestry in Malawi, work done in Zimbabwe in 1920 that was published in Zimbabwe Agriculture Journal. So we have been working a long time on green manures and agroforestry, and I very much support these efforts. But what we don't have is this third way, this middle, something that gives us food today. And even in the US, cover crop adoption has gone up, but mostly when it's used for grazing or when people are paid. So there has to be investment beyond fertilizer subsidies in green farmers to be able to rehabilitate their soils. And one of the straightforward ways would be if we had investment in uh, types of crops that could be used for food. So whether it's teaching people how to use uh, Lab Lab or Makuna as a food source, you could look at it from that way, you know, reducing the pesticides, uh, toxic chemicals in those seeds, or at the same time increasing, you know, the long duration of pigeon pea. Like I said, nobody has looked at it as to ratoon it. Nobody, in other words, to cut it and have it come to the second year. Nobody's seen how different variety. And we recently did a bibliography that is on our website. If you Google perennial grains in Africa, you'll see that, you know, this idea of multi-purpose crops that can grow for several years hasn't been developed. There's been no breeding investment, no agronomy. A little bit, but really pie in the sky type work. There hasn't been much on the ground agronomy to try and develop practical options, not just trees, but something that farmers can use now, such as grasses and vines and bushes that they can use for a couple of years that produce grain, right, for food, which people really need to invest in. So I think there's been a lack of that. Also, understanding the interactions with weeds has come out today. Very little research has investigated trade-offs uh, in sustainable intensification, labor requirements. I think we're moving towards more multidisciplinarity, but it's difficult sometimes to um, have enough funding to bring together a full team and to focus on research because we always rightly end up having to do development along the way. So we need to see more partnerships in my view with, uh, with NGOs and such so they can do more of the development and then as academics um, we can support capacity building in Africa and Latin America and South Asia so that people can do their own research on sustainable intensification in support of their uh, government um, to improve their policies and so on. So I think capacity building more generally in this whole agroecology area is lacking and then um, obviously having more options that are practical. Because we have to admit that we have been there in terms of green manure. So well, I'm challenging everyone to take the next step. Thanks. Yeah, if I Sure, yeah, I mean, I 100% support what uh, Sig was just saying. Um, you know, there are so many different ways that <laughs> you can manage green manure cover crop systems uh, that it's really good to have some strong evidence in terms of what's effective. And, and actually, in that process, I think it's really important that we have farmer participation also so that we really get that perspective right from the beginning. Um, but 
what Sieg was saying, we really need a middle way that's going to work well for the soil, but also really work well for farm households, both in the short term and the long term. Um, another area where some research might be useful, I think, is in terms of the policies and incentives that really will help with adoption. Uh, yeah. And the last thing I'll comment is uh, we're <laughs> it's great to be working with Sig here, but we recently started, so CRS started working with Africa Rising to look at some of these systems in a longer term way, uh, and we'd like to do that in Malawi too, but I think the connection between the research and development process and, and participation of farmers is crucial. Thanks. Thank you. I'll, I'm to pass the microphone over to Jerry to ask a question. Yeah, uh, thanks. So given the Paris meetings on climate change over the past week and the fact that you both have worked in different parts of the world on these issues for a couple of decades or more, I'd, I'd like to get your perspective on the feedbacks you know, between soil degradation or soil restoration and climate change and, of course, what, what your, your sense is as we move forward, growing populations, greater land constraints, and so on. And that's uh, both of you. Let's fly, take a first crack. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, OK. So, you know, I, I think in the beginning of, of the presentation, I was saying, and I think it's, it's worth emphasizing that to avoid a food crisis, we really need uh, to improve the soil. Uh, and I think that's a given. So in investments there are not important, they're essential. Uh, in helping us deal with the problems that are coming, not just from climate change, but from an increasing population, the need to produce more food in situ. The other thing is, in regard, if we do have climate change, so some areas will have more water, some areas will have less water. But in either case, you know, building up the soil organic matter and its capacity to absorb water and retain water is crucial, both to prevent flooding and to make sure that you know water resources remain much more available. And there's a huge amount that we can do. And actually, it was Mike McGehee was sent me a note to say, maybe we should be looking uh, not only at the soils for, for productivity, but also for their capacity to efficiently manage water. Uh, maybe that's crucial. And I think that was a really important point. Uh, the last thing in regards to climate change that uh, I got some comments from Roland Bunch, and he was he's done more calculations on this than I have, but he's saying if we can really improve the soil organic matter uh, to a really good level, like say four percent uh, in the soil, that that's almost the equivalent of having a forest on your soil in terms of amount of carbon that can sequester. It can sequester a very large amount of carbon. And I think, I don't know the figures exactly, but I think the, the, the sentiment is certainly true. So, that's just a couple comments there. I'll hand over to Sig. That, that was a great point, Jeff. I uh, really, <laughs> great to be back with you again. Uh, I would also point out that adaptation to climate change, that in agronomy, you know, we talk about instead of genetics by environment by management to increase yield, we talk about, you know, to improve performance, we need to understand options by context. And so we need to make sure, you know, investments are made in education so that the adaptation capacity of farmers is increased in rural communities to be able to cope with uh, climate change, because it may take, you know, different forms in different places, whether it's increasing disease, uh, you know, this is probably one of the biggest push problems facing people that are not thought about, and the intense uh, storms and droughts, uh, both are occurring more and more frequently. So adaptation is, is very important, um, so investment in education, in helping uh, household uh, or community level things, you just kind of add new development so that people have resilience networks such as 
uh, you know, grain storage and um, have other different range of, of livelihood. But on the crop level, I think crop diversification, although many people in this audience would agree with it's important, policy still are promoting more and more soil cropping and uh, consolidated land as we're seeing in Rwanda. So we need to keep providing evidence. I mean, that's our advantage as scientists is to try and find data to try and remind people of the benefits for resilience in terms of just diversification of cropping and animal options rather than moving for, for smallholder farmers, I think it's very dangerous to move towards uh, reliance on just a few crops and then assume that the markets are perfect and people will be able to buy uh, and, and support their way out of um, extreme situations. But we, just, we still need to have local resilience and policies that support education and local markets, not just uh, market value chains. So a more holistic approach, I think, is just vital in this rapidly changing world and an education one, focused one. All right, well, we have reached uh, our official end time at the top of the hour. And I, I, I don't want to keep anyone um, too much longer. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up and say uh, an extremely grateful thank you to our two presenters for uh, joining us remotely and for giving some really excellent presentations and answering as many questions as you could.